Good morning, and welcome to a palindrome day, February 22nd, 20, 2022, meeting of the Education Finance Committee of the Minnesota House. Remote hearings are held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This rule has been posted online and is, is linked to in our public meeting notice on the House website. All remote hearings will be recorded and live streamed by House Public Information Services. Members, you have the contents of your virtual packets available and for the public, these same materials have been posted online. Members, if you're looking for all these items in one place, they are attached in the calendar event you have that Ms. Burt sent for today. To get on the list to be recognized by the chair, members using the Zoom interface have the ability to raise their hand via the app. Ms. Burt will place your name on the list to be recognized. Mr. Lee, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Dabney. Roll call will commence now. Uh, chair Dabney? Present. Representative Sandstead? Present. Representative Cresha? Representative Cresha? Cresha, present. Representative Bennett? Present. Representative Daniels? Daniels, present. Representative Damith? Present. Representative Dravkowski? Present. Representative Erickson? Erickson, present. Representative Feist? Present. Representative Jordan? Jordan, present. Representative Marquardt? Marquardt, present. Representative Mueller? Mueller, present. Representative Richardson? Present. Representative Thompson? Representative Thompson? Representative Thompson, present. Representative Walgamot? Walgamot, present. Representative Shung? Representative Shung? Representative Joaquim? Representative Joaquim? We have 15 members present, uh, establishes quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Representative Sandsteed, have you had the opportunity to review the minutes from Thursday, February 17th? And if so, would you like to move their approval? Good morning, Mr. Chair, I have, and I so move their approval. Thank you very much. Members, any discussion to the Sandsteed motion? Seeing none, members, this is a voice vote. If you would please unmute. All those in favor of the Sandsteed motion approving the minutes from Thursday, February 17th, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion prevails. Thank you very much. Members, this week we'll be spending our time discussing the social and emotional learning needs of students, along with academic achievement needs for students, and perhaps the connection between those two. Today we'll be, we will begin with House File 3578 from Representative Vang. It's our intention to lay this bill over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill by 10.50 a.m. Uh, Representative Sandsteed, again, would you like to make a motion to move House File 3578 be before the committee to lay it over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Representative Sandsteed. Representative Vang, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and introduce your bill. Thank you, Chair Daphne and committee members. Uh, I'm Representative Samantha Vang from Brooklyn Center. Uh, I am here to introduce House File 3587, uh, which will appropriate 90 million for the general from the general fund to the Minnesota Department of Education for comprehensive support for full service community schools in the state. Uh, grants will be prioritized in the following order. Uh, grant recipients under the full uh, service grant program, uh, the schools identified under the uh, Federal Every Student Succeeds Act at Low Performing, and then any other school interested in becoming a full service community school. Uh, in 2009, Brooklyn Center became Minnesota's first community school district. Uh, there were programs at certain school sites dating back in the 90s at Duluth and St. Paul, but none, none district-wide until Brooklyn Center. Brooklyn Center saw its expulsions and suspensions go down as a result of the model and gra graduation rates increased largely. Uh, about 77.4% of Black seniors graduated in 2020 from Brooklyn Center High School compared 
to a 69%, sorry, 69% of black students statewide. Uh, we often talked about bridging opportunity gaps in our education system and full service community schools is a model we can utilize. Uh, many students, especially students in underserved communities are likely to miss instructional school days due to issues probably outside of the classroom, uh, such as basic needs not being met at home. And so full service community school can bridge those resources to help students so their full attention and time can be spent in the classroom. Uh, you will hear from my testifiers why this funding is needed to sustain the successes of full service community schools. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield my time. Thank you very much, Representative Vang. And let me first note uh, the Chair misspoke. Uh, this is House File 3587. I transposed the last two numbers. So uh, unless there's objection, we'll simply update uh, the Sandsteed motion uh, to be referred to House File 35. 87. Thank you. With that, uh, we have a couple of testifiers for Representative Vang's bill. The first is Dr. Carly Baker, Superintendent of the Brooklyn Center Community Schools. Dr. Baker, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carly Baker. I am the proud and grateful superintendent of Brooklyn Center Community School District 286. Thank you, Representative Vang, Chair Dabney, and members of the committee. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to appear before you today to talk about the importance of funding for full service community schools. This morning, I'd like to speak briefly about how the success of full service community schools hinges on the leveraging of community partnerships to meet the needs of the school community, how the presence and involvement of parents is integral to the success of programming, also to offer some measures and highlights for success, and how our FSCS model, school community and community as a whole have been impacted by the two public health crises that have spanned the last three school years for us, the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial reckoning following the police killings of George Floyd and Dante Wright locally, and so many other black and brown bodies nationally. One of the cornerstones of full service community schools um, is that of community partnerships to meet the unique needs of the community that's being served. So for us in Brooklyn Center, we have long standing partnerships that have that exist to respond to the types of needs that we know that our community members are always facing. And those needs are a product of um, systems inequities. Um, Representative Vang spoke to the opportunity gap. Also, we're looking at systemic challenges and inequities that exist across all public service systems. Um, we have specifically identified partnerships with Park Nicollet the Children's Dental Services, Annex Teen Clinic, which provides um, sexual health uh, access, education support, the Family Partnership, um, which offers along with Park Nicollet um, medical, a combination of medical family partnership offering mental health support and therapy, SEEP, which offers um, access to scarcity resources in terms of food, supplies, et cetera, Timber Bay, which is a mentorship experience, um, as well as um, Girl Scouts, and, as an example. Because we know how to operate through these partnerships, we also nurture new relationships to address the needs as they arise or as our community makes it very clear um, that there is a need. We've launched a youth participatory action research program in partnership with, you, with Youth Rock and the University of Minnesota's Urban Research and Outreach Engagement Center. We now offer more time for our secondary students to engage in enrichment activities. Um, knowing that they need time to explore their interests and identities, and we are constantly building new partnerships to support this work. In an acute crisis, um, the Brooklyn Bridge Alliance for Youth has worked with Youth Prize to establish the Brooklyn's Response and Recovery Fund, which was um, an outcome following the police killing of Dante Wright, where we were able to support 122 families with direct aid. Um, did the design of three youth empowerment programs were also funded as a result of, of that partnership. An additional funding component, fundamental component rather, of the full service community schools model is that of parent engagement in the design and modeling of the program. 
um, working with developing authentic and intentional relationships between school staff, teachers, and families, um, that partnership between home and school, between school and community um, has strengthened because we have resources devoted toward demonstrating a holistic approach that is um, deeply devoted to the care of well being for our community. Um, there is a requirement of the F FSCS leadership groups to consist of 30% representation from parents. This um, sets the um, authentic engagement um, of parents up as, as um, something that is, is um, a cornerstone of, of the way that the entire design works. Now, with that said, authentic parent and family engagement is a continual work in progress. Our systems of public education are designed and dictated to tell parents how they, how we want to hear from them. We in Brooklyn Center are working actively to dismantle this model and instead to flip it so that we're engaging with families the way they want to be engaged with um, and to involve them in ways that are both meaningful and important to them and not the other way around. So next, I know that there are wonderings and have been requests for what the data is telling us regarding how full service community schools is positively impacting proficiency and achievement scores for our children as a metric for the success of programming and as a motivator to fund at the legislative level. So with that notion in mind, I will say this, we are not showing growth in proficiency measures in Brooklyn Center. And there are several root causes for this, both from a systemic standpoint, as well as a societal standpoint. To begin, our children often come to us multiple grade levels behind. We serve a community of 94% families of color, 85% of our families are receiving free and reduced meals. Systemic obstacles of, to access are rampant in our system. This is not to mention the fact that proficiency measures are not culturally normed and are designed to assess prior knowledge and experiences of folks who look like me, not 94% of the families that I serve. The second layer here is that many of our young people are confronting obstacles on the basic needs level of Maslow's hierarchy before they even reach the front doors of our um, schools or of our Zoom rooms for instruction. Don't get me wrong, the teachers in Brooklyn Center can teach. And yet, irrespective of how stellar their instructional virtuosities are or how engaging their lessons are, if a child is hungry, does not have stable housing, or is battling undiagnosed or unaddressed mental health issues, it just doesn't matter what's being taught. Our young people can't hear it. That's precisely why full service community schools is so critical to communities like mine. We are able to better meet the needs of the whole child, which gives us the space to move them toward authentic learning, which ultimately impacts the picture of our growth. And that is why we focus more so on that, um, the picture of growth of our babies and not just the proficiency measure as a snapshot in time. Anecdotally, and as I close, um, you'd be hard pressed to find a staff or community member in Brooklyn Center that doesn't stand behind this model. Teachers know their students need glasses to engage in learning. Parents know dental care is important. Social workers know students need stable housing. We all know that our brilliant young people need opportunities to learn about themselves, to be successful, and to be celebrated in a safe and flourishing community. I have a lot more to say, but I wanna be respectful of time and I wanna make sure that Mr. Sage has, has an opportunity to testify as well. So I appreciate your time and space this morning and for prioritizing this critical opportunity um, that, that can greatly benefit our young people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Appreciate that testimony. Uh, members, we'll take questions after Mr. Sage uh, testifies. Uh, next on our agenda, Joe Sage, principal at Faribault Middle School. Mr. Sage, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Joe Sage. And thank you, Dr. Baker, for everything you shared. Um, that was that was amazing. Uh, good morning, Chair and Committee members. Uh, my name is Joe Sage, and I've had the pleasure of working as the principal at Faribault Middle School for Faribault Public Schools. I appreciate this opportunity to share with you some of the some of the success uh, that we have seen with our community school model. Faribault's two community school sites provide enriching and impactful programs and services for students, families, and community members. In a normal school year, the community school team partners across the district and the community to bring programs and services on site at Jefferson Elementary and uh, Faribault Middle School. These programs and services, to name just a few, 
include things like dental clinics, flu, uh, flu vaccinations, sports physicals, enrichments, and academic activities. We provide clubs and activities that are specific to the individual needs of the students. These programs, which offer voice and choice, provide us with endless opportunities to address the social, emotional, and mental health of our students. Because of the true intent of the full service community school model, which strives to create long lasting and deep partnerships within the school district and community, we were ready to navigate the uncharted disruption of the coronavirus pandemic. Since March of 2020, our community school team has worked alongside district food service staff, teachers, principals, coordinators, and community-based organizations to maximize the opportunities and provide learning and support and exciting programs in person and when necessary at a distance, connecting our families to essential services. Through established social media presence, family connectedness, and community collaboration, our full service community school model has helped to deliver essential services such as food access, emergency worker childcare, and supply distribution in a well-organized and, and seamless fashion. Given the overwhelmingly positive results of our approach and the high number of families we reached during, during the pandemic and after, school districts throughout Minnesota deserve an opportunity to integrate a full service community model into their normal school operations. I also believe that schools that are currently running community schools deserve that opportunity to expand and continue to offer these incredibly important services. Not only were we able to have the advantages of the community school model pre-pandemic, we were still, we are still uniquely positioned by the well-established family and community engagement efforts of the community school to stand stronger together and to provide opportunities for our students. I stand before you today as the proud principal of a school that offers community school. In a recent survey conducted at FMS, over 90% of students felt as though they had a caring adult in the building. I am extremely confident that the community school played a role in this. When the pandemic hit and schools shut down, our community education department and community school came through. They didn't run away from the pandemic, they ran straight towards it. Their model of instruction is one that we should be mirroring within our normal school day. When you consider our students' mental health, I believe that we can move mountains when we provide opportunities for our students to feel connected to our school and our community. Uh, this in short is what our community school is striving to accomplish. I urge you to consider this bill as it will have a tremendous impact on our students, school and community. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Principal Sage. Appreciate your time this morning. Members, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of the bill hearing. We received one request for public testimony. Mr. Uni, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, committee members, <clears throat> pardon me. My name is Adosh Uni, and I am the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. And thank you for the opportunity to provide support here for HF 3587 to provide more funding for full service community schools. As you all know and have heard, these, uh, these community schools are important programs to broaden community engagement and provide access to wraparound supports in schools and community and local communities. The full service community school model is one strategy that evidence suggests can improve student outcomes in schools where other school uh, improvement efforts have not demonstrated as much success. Previous evaluations have demonstrated that the provision of wraparound supports through the full service community school model improve factors associated with graduation, while also improving several other student outcomes related to school climate, including student attendance, school attachment, and behavior outcomes. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and its disproportionate impacts on families already struggling with basic needs, the full service community schools model um, is likely to continue to be a beneficial strategy for students and, and families. During the pandemic, Minnesota, uh, MDE learned about schools that had adopted the full service community school model prior to the start of the distance learning period who were able to adapt to the needs of families and communities quickly by leveraging existing partnerships and resources. Uh, Governor Waltz has supported funding full service community schools, including proposing funding last year. And after the education budget last year did not result in further funding, the governor allocated $5 million in ARP funds to support full service community schools. I believe you have more information about these grantees in your packets. As the testimony here has indicated, communities and their schools continue to demonstrate the need for ongoing sustained funding for this program. 
Governor has again proposed funding for schools, uh, full service community schools with $5 million per year. And additionally, his budget also proposes $1 million per year to support full service community school models in our intermediate districts. A need we heard about recently from Superintendent Lewandowski in the Education Policy Committee. Thank you again for the opportunity to support, uh, to provide supportive testimony for these efforts to provide ongoing sustained support for implementing full service community schools in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. Uh, before calling on Representative Erickson, who's been waiting patiently with her question, I'll uh, note that Representatives Zhuang and Uakim uh, joined us during Dr. Baker's testimony. With that, Representative Erickson, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, testifiers and uh, uh, Representative Bang for this proposal. Uh, my question is for Dr. Baker. You know, the state, uh, provides yearly over $500 million for compensatory in compensatory revenue. So how does your uh, school district use that to uh, close the achievement gap? Uh, and uh, if there are other ways in which you use the compensatory revenue, uh, please share that with us. Dr. Baker. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Erickson for your question. Um, compensatory dollars are currently used in a variety of um, avenues in our district. Um, we, we use those dollars and push always, um, as a general rule, we push all dollars um, into our sites as much as we possibly can. Um, so compensatory dollars specifically are spent around elevating the number of staff members that provide specific um, and targeted academic intervention um, for our most vulnerable and marginalized groups, which are those generally identified and served through both compensatory dollars as well as title dollars, which we receive a significant amount. So some examples of those um, funding additional positions would be um, reading intervention and math intervention teachers, um, additional social work and counseling positions that provide um, because Brooklyn Center really focuses on the approach of the um, service of the whole child. So if both um, from the standpoint that we have to come at it from two directions, right? It has to be about academic intervention and acceleration. And, and now, um, you know, the, the specific attention to the academic impacts, detrimental academic impacts that were created through the isolation of the pandemic, um, as well as simultaneously being able to create and provide support for those marginalized populations from a social, emotional, mental health and well-being standpoint. And so we do that through additional um, support positions that would be able to provide some more um, intensive and targeted um, intervention for young people. Representative Erickson, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Baker, do those compensatory revenues flow into the full service area as well? They do. Um, we. Yes, thank you. Um, we spend additional dollars toward um, targeted services and providing um, the build out of our out of school time programming um, through braided funding. So that comes from compensatory, it comes from targeted services, it comes from um, our 21st century grant funding as well. And through that, we focus on this notion of that the school day doesn't just start and end from bell to bell, but rather we have a number of students um, who spend uh, between 10 and 12 hours um, with us every day. So we um, place additional um, financial priorities toward um, the things that, that those young people need, that they're going to need out of school, enriching opportunities to be engaged and be challenged and be fulfilled to create a safe space for them um, to be fed. Many of our students access three meals a day with us, as well as a snack um, at all of our sites across our district. Um, and then additional academic support programming outside of school um, in those out of school time programming too. And that's been a fundamental piece for us in um, the design of our full service community school model. That idea of that the four pillars of community schools is not treated as something that is just a separate entity, but rather it is built into every facet of design in our district. So if we're looking at any categorical fund, um, it is going to be braided and um, integrated within the uh, consideration of the four um, pillars of community schools. Representative Erickson, any further follow-up? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, Dr. Baker, if you have data that shows these targeted interventions have made a difference, I hope you would share that with us. 
And for Mr. Oni, we don't have in our package how the American Rescue dollars uh, helped these full service uh, schools uh, and communities. So I hope that you would provide that for us too. Uh, my concern is that uh, I know in Brooklyn Center, uh, full service community was started without state dollars because the superintendent who began it was one of my former superintendents. And my hat's off to him for being so bold as to determine that within the school budget, you could begin this kind of, of programming for your community. Uh, but, but in light of the fact that there's so much compensatory revenue flowing, uh, I'm hoping that um, we can see evidence and in the grants, uh, uh, I hope that we will see uh, evidence-based also there uh, when the funding goes out so that we know there's a, a, a loss of learning rescue uh, because the loss of learning among our children, and I'm sure that's true in Brooklyn Center, and I did enjoy the virtual tour uh, of your facility when we had that uh, opportunity a few weeks ago, but the loss of learning, uh, and especially among your targeted uh, students uh, who are getting these interventions, you know, we need to know that that's paying off. So I hope that you will provide us with that data uh, so that we can know that there is uh, a, um, a positive result when these kinds of uh, programs are created uh, and uh, that the focus would always be on uh, the academics because that's the first and foremost reason that we exist as a state education uh, program and department uh, is to ensure that our children leave school well educated so they have a future ahead of them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Representative Vang, would you like to respond? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to add that um, with my limited knowledge of comp compensatory funding, um, I, I believe it's based off the number of students who qualify for freedom reduced funds, and that will require parents disclosing their income. And sometimes, um, you know, parents may not want to disclose their income, and and the paperwork may be uh, may uh, may not really show the need of. Uh, uh, how much funding is needed within that comp compensatory funding. Sorry, I'm having some sort of tongue twister moment. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't recommend the committee to look at stretching the dollars of, of that funding. Um, this bill provides that dedicated and sustainable funding to make sure that the funding will go towards for service community schools. Uh, there's not uh, data available um, that shows how schools districts are spending their compensatory funding. Um, and so I, with this bill, it makes sure that the funding will go towards the site, site coordinator uh, that is necessary to make sure that um, they build a relationship with the parents along with the community partnerships um, and also addressing the needs assessments. Um, so it's really important that we continue to look at um, making sure we have dedicated targeted funding targeted funding for service community schools rather than stretching dollars from elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Vang. Uh, Mr. Uni, your name was mentioned. Yeah, that, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and committee members. Again, my name is Ado Shuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Missouri Department of Education. Um, to Representative Erickson's point, uh, yeah, my, my apologies. Um, we had, uh, staff had reached out to us in, in a timely fashion to get uh, data about the grantees. Unfortunately, we were on a the, most of the agency was on holiday uh, yesterday, so we got the information this morning and got it over. But I do believe it, it should be posted, so the information should be there. But happy to happy to um, to bring it back up again. Um, and to your point about evidence-based strategies, that is an excellent one. I know you, this had been brought up earlier in session around the legislation that was passed uh, last year um, that I know that Representative Bennett had had. Um, had been advocating for. And I can tell you that full service community schools is one of those strategies that is evidence-based. It's been run through um, the analysis that uh, Minnesota Management and Budget Department does on all of our programs that we put forward at the, in the administration around what, uh, whether they are evidence-based and research-based and full service community schools does come out as one of those. And we're happy to provide that information. Um, and two, I think that the point around compensatory revenue, I would echo representative 
President Vang's point around the consistent expectation and statute around the components that the program has, um, the community needs survey, the site coordinator, and the components that uh, a program would have to provide that's reflective of its community provides consistent expectations for communities when they when they provide it and great direction to schools of how to implement those programs effectively and for the best outcomes for their students and community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. Represent Representative Feist. Well, I didn't realize I was next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to echo uh, Representative Ving's um, response regarding Representative Erickson's question about compensatory revenue. Um, I believe that our compensatory revenue does not go far enough. Um, I introduced legislation last session to increase it, um, but I believe that the full service community schools model is evidence-based and truly effective in addressing the opportunity gap um, and, and that this type of investment is definitely warranted. Um, and also, as Representative Vang mentioned, um, compensatory revenue is tied to free and reduced lunch levels. And we know that that is not uh, the best model uh, to measure uh, where to send those compensatory dollars. And I'm sure that Representative Jordan is going to mention how this interferes with our um, ability to address hunger in schools. <laughs> um, and, and and so I just wanted to mention that as well. And that's something that I'll be introducing legislation to address. Um, but I, I just wanted to wholeheartedly agree with Representative Vang that the question of compensatory revenue is really separate and apart um, from this important investment that she is proposing that we make. And I wholeheartedly support. Thank you. Thank you, Rep Representative Feist. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we heard the successes of the full service community schools um, with um, their ability to deliver services to students. But I'm wondering if uh, specifically the administrator from, I believe it was uh, Brooklyn Center and Faribault who shared with us, um, if they could share the academic successes, the academic growth and graduation rate growth successes from those schools. So it looks like they received grants in 2016 and 17. And so there should be, have been time to uh, note that growth so could, uh, could those administrators perhaps share some of that data for academic growth and graduation rate growth? Mr. Sage. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we have seen um, academic growth and, and we've seen growth, we've seen social emotional growth as well. What's been really cool about um, some of the programs uh, that we've offered here is there's been some um, some braiding with a, a program called RISE, which is realizing individual student excellence. So our, our community school model has worked very closely with RISE, uh, which again targets students um, and, and tries to provide more opportunities for them, not only at the middle school, uh, but at the high school level. Um, but in terms of, of academics, and, and we also look at things in around attendance, um, and we look at things around our students uh, feeling connected. I can't speak as, as well. I did actually work at the high school for many years uh, and, our, we, and our graduation rate, we did see improve. But at the middle school model, um, just through our surveys, you know, hearing kids feel that they are connected to the school and that there's a sense of belonging um, has increased according to our survey data. Um, I was actually just in a meeting prior to hopping mm -hmm. in this around uh, offering uh, that survey again to see, you know, over the course of the year, which is now, you know, semi post pandemic, knock on wood, um, to see, you know, how, how students will feel uh, at the end of the year. Uh, was I able to answer that question for you? Representative Bennett? Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, those are, are, yeah, that's interesting growth and, and how students feel about connecting to their school, I, I do believe is important, but I guess our end goal is really here academic growth um, and success and graduation rate success. So I, I, you may not have that data on your fingertips and I appreciate what you already shared, but if you could get us that data, um, that would be much appreciated because I do think we need to, in the end, measure the, the things that really are what we're looking for, which would be in that academic area, graduation rate and so on. So thank you. Thank you. And we'll be happy to get that for you. Thank you, Mr. Page, or excuse me, Sage. Representative Joachim. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to echo support for the full service community school model. Um, full service community school models don't necessarily always overlap with the students that are served with compensatory aid or the ones that are collecting compensatory aid. Full service community schools help all of our students in the schools. And it's a perfect example of a private public partnership as well when we're helping get the director to reach out into the community and pull services in the community. And I know uh, one of the goals of our schools is education, of course, academics forefront, mm -hmm. but it's really hard for kids to learn how to do math if they're coming to school with an empty stomach or with food and not just food insecurity, but housing insecurity, mental health issues, which we'll hear about later. Um, full service community schools really addresses the whole student so they can excel to their full potential. And I think we'd be absolutely foolish not to fund it. Thank you so much, Representative Vang, for bringing this bill forward. Thank you, Representative Yuakim. Representative Jordan. It, uh, and to, for the members, I've got Representative Jordan, Representative Thompson, and then Representative Krisha. We are uh, over time on this bill. Well, Mr. Chair, then I don't need to pile on about the importance of full service community schools. Um, I hope you'll all support my bill around universal meals to help us get around our compensatory issue with um, meals. That's all. Thank you very much, Representative Jordan. Representative Thompson. Hey, Representative uh, uh, Chair, I'm, I'm very quick. I was echoing the uh, sentiment of our other uh, colleague and would love to see the data uh, uh, the principal Joe Sage spoke of. I would, just, I would love to see the data and the breakdown and that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Representative Krisha, last up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Bank for bringing your bill forward. Just a couple of closing comments. Um, certainly think that we need to be putting our investments into programs that have demonstrated success and sustainability. And I think that lacks here. I appreciate the superintendent, the principal coming forward, but we need some strong academic measures and we actually need to see the data to put this forward. The other thing that I would just offer up, this bill has an uphill battle. Um, the schools that I talk to are still dealing with uh, shortage in bus drivers, teachers and super uh, substitute teachers. I, I don't hear anybody asking for staff or program coordinators or non-teaching positions. So I think that the committee would be well served to address the programs and uh, that would fix the problems at hand and what we're hearing from our schools today. So, but Representative Vang, good luck with your bill. I'm sure we'll see this later uh, as the session moves on. Thank you, Representative Krisha. Representative Vang, any brief closing uh, comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for this engaging conversation. Um, you know, we hear all around, uh, you know, staffing shortages um, and, and the needs uh, that we need to be met in, in the education area and, um, once again, you know, we also hear the need for full service community schools and um, making sure that we have the sustainable site coordinators and, and, and addressing the needs of the community. That's also um, a demand on rise to your well. So um, it's not one or the other. It's, it's we should do all we can to make sure that we can meet everybody's needs. Um, and I look forward to member support and engaging conversation. Thank you, Representative Vang. And with that, Representative Sandsteed renews her motion to lay over House File 3587 for possible inclusion or, or further consideration at a later date. Thank you very much. Thank you to the testifiers. Next on our agenda is, excuse me, is House File 786 from Representative Lee. It's our intention to lay this bill over by 1130. Representative Feist, would you like to make a motion to move House File 786 to be before the committee? for further uh, consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? Yes, Mr. Chair, so moved. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Lee, welcome back to the committee. Before you introduce your bill, I understand that you have an author's amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill in the shape you'd prefer. Uh, members, I will move for Representative Lee, the A3 amendment to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape that he desires. Uh, Representative Lee, any comments to the A3? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. The A3 uh, does a few things. It clarifies that tribal government can apply for the funds. Has always been our intent, but just want to make sure that you know they are able to apply. Uh, adds a fourth objective to the program to make sure that expanding program access in underserved community is a priority for the grant program. And then also uh, change the appropriations to invest in 25 million into the base budget. This is the uh, funding shortfall that we have seen uh, with the, uh, the need across the entire state. Thank you, Representative Lee. Members, this is a voice vote. 
Uh, I'd ask everyone to unmute. Seeing no dis any discussion to the Lee Amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor of the adoption of the A3, sig please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Thank you, committee members. Representative Lee, to your bill is amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for uh, the opportunity to prevent House File 786 as amended. Uh, this bill is a statewide initiative supported by many organizations that work together through the state's after school network called Night After School. Uh, the purpose of the bill is to expand high quality after school programs to thousands of underserved students who might not otherwise have the means to participate in youth enrichment activities. Uh, we're asking for a major investment from the state, $25 million each year, which will cover the unfunded requests for these programs that we see every time a uh, competitive grant process takes place for a program like this. Uh, we know students were struggling before the pandemic, and now things are worse for many of them. I believe this bill will uh, close the gaps that we are seeing by bringing in another workforce uh, of positive adults to work with our students and inspire them and give them a safe space for their social and emotional development outside of the traditional uh, classroom. Uh, this program support our educators by giving students another safe and healthy environment and support our working parents. I know that uh, high quality after school has been uh, a very important piece and aspect of my life. And that's why I'm you know, here today to help support this so that you know uh, our students can be connected with uh, trusting adults in their life so that you know they could have the opportunity to actually pursue whatever they want to you know like many of us who are here today and then uh, I have a few testifiers Mr. Chair I'll turn it over for you to uh, introduce them. Thank you very much Representative Lee. First on my list is Zhang Vang uh, with Ignite After School. Ms. Vang welcome to the committee please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Dabney. My, not, my name is Zong Bang, and um, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about House File 786. Um, again, my name is Zong Bang, and I'm the Policy Strategy Manager at Ignite, at Ignite After School. As Minnesota's statewide after school network, Ignite brings together a broad range of after school stakeholders, both nonprofit and public sector after school and summer learning providers, funders, and local after school collaboratives to increase access to high quality after school and summer programs. During the COVID 19 global pandemic, Ignite documented the changing needs of young people and their families and the ways after school providers were pivoting to meet those needs. Many young people are struggling through mental health challenges brought on by the pressures of the pandemic. Our partner, the Greater Twin Cities United Way, provides free and confidential emotional support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress as part of the National uh, Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network. In 2021, roughly 10% of the calls United Way fielded were from young people under the age of 15. We know young people are struggling. Despite the challenges, we know that protective factors such as caring adults, especially those found at schools and community organizations that offer relationships and enriching activities help young people thrive. Many community-based organizations that provide after school and summer programs played expanded roles during the pandemic. And we told these stories on our Yes to Success blog. So for example, Clues uh, transitioned their Young Youth in Action College Access Program that connects young people to mentors and their managing stress groups for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students online. These after school and mental health supports were critically important to ensure that young people could process their experience and be connected in culturally relevant ways. Another example is Neighborhood House. They quickly turned one of their sites into a distance learning center where each young person had a workspace with reliable internet that was socially distanced from others. Young people received snacks and meals through a food program partnership with Youth Price. Students came in with lots of unfinished assignments and staff supported students by helping them get caught up with their class assignments. Students were also able to have safe and fun environment um, and build important relationships as well. Uh, neighborhood House provided art, provi 
programming and built-in time for physical activity, including walks to nearby parks. At Ignite, we know that after school and summer learning programs are a critical piece of the COVID-19 recovery. And we need these organizations and programs to continue their work. I've invited Michelle Barnes from Pillsbury United Communities to share directly why this work is so important. Also to hear direct from a young person, we are joined by Michaela Smith, Sims, sorry, a 12th grade high school student and participant at Beacons, which is an after school program at her high school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vang. Ms. Barnes, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Excuse me. My name is Michelle Barnes. I use they, them pronouns. Thank you. Thank you, Zong, for uh, inviting me. And thank you, chair and uh, house chair, members of the committee. Um, I'll be speaking uh, on behalf of the House File 76. Um, once again, my name is Michelle Barnes, my name is or Michelle B. Uh, I'm the youth media manager for youth for Pillsbury United Communities Wade House, currently building the KRSM Youth Media Internship uh, Program at KRSM in the Phillips community in South Minneapolis. I can't. I come to you now in the wake of the tragic murders of two black high school students in Richfield and in North Minneapolis by the names of Jamari Rice and Deshaun Hill. The shooters in the murder of Jamari Rice are also high school students in the same school. Our youth are hurting. I know that there is no simple solution to prevent this kind of internalized violence, but I know that our youth right now are hurting all across our city. Now more than ever, is it critical to support out of school programming as it is an extension of our youth school day. Between the time they get out of bed and the time that they return to it, hopefully they do, they should be able to expect it to be filled with love, filled with engagement, positive stimulation, growth, nurturing, evolution of their interests, new opportunities, strong relationships, and tools for their futures. Most of my interns come to us through the Step Up program funded by the city of Minneapolis. This program allows teens from working class families, most being black, indigenous, youth of color, or immigrant families to explore paid internships throughout the summer. Also, throughout the, through the Minnesota Department of Economic Development, my program, the KRSM Youth Media Interns, are able to be involved in uh, year-round involvement um, that, that allows us to fund that, their involvement in that. This involvement includes using broadcasts as a platform to honor their voices, creating their own narratives, becoming youth leaders by hosting workshops for their peers, but most recently includes collaborating with the Department of Sociology at the University of St. Thomas. As an added benefit of my internship that is that I intentionally support and work very closely with my interns to secure their positions in higher education upon graduation, along with community involvement as well. This year long funding is critical to supporting our youth. Not only is it important that they have meaningful experiences outside of school, but that they are also able to learn, earn wages to chip away at transitioning out of poverty and into successful futures. Whether or not this funding will directly contribute to youth wages is an important, the important message here is that this funding of out of school youth programming is a powerful way for youth specialists like myself to work as hard as we can to support the lives of our youth. And, I, and when I say support the lives of our youth, I truly mean keeping them safe and supported long enough for them to actually live out their childhood because they are hurting and they are literally dying. Thank you, Chair and the members of the committee. Thank you, Michelle B. I appreciate your time this morning. Next on the agenda, Michaela Sims, uh, 12th grade Beacons participant and intern from the Edison High School. Ms. Sims, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair and committee members. My name is Kayla Sims. I am a 12th grader at Edison High School in Minneapolis. The pandemic has affected everyone, but today I'm here to speak to my experience and the experience of my peers. Before COVID, I was almost a straight A student. I enjoyed school and learning was easy. I felt connected and mentally healthy. My friend group was similar. During distance learning, this was completely different. School was challenging for me. I was barely able to keep up with the online assignments. I saw similar things in my peers. 
Those who used to get A's and B's in person were getting C's and D's in virtual learning. Others were even failing classes, putting their graduation at risk. Many people were balancing school, work, and family responsibilities. This took a huge strain on mental health. Since coming back to in-person school this year, things have been a little bit easier, but it has been a big adjustment. Me and my peers are trying to make up missed credits and getting used to being physically in the classroom all day. We are also trying to make up for the two years of missed social connections with each other. Beacons, my after-school program, has been a big help in making this transition easier. Beacon staff have helped us get used to being back in school and made sure we were able to get back into the group of staying after school. Beacons also helps young people to share our voices and advocate for ourselves to teachers and school staff during this hard transition. I am now back on track. I stay after school every day as a youth employee, helping to recruit other Beacons young people and making sure they feel supported and are on track. I run our Black Student Union and get to mentor elementary youth at Nellie Stone Johnson Elementary School. These leadership opportunities are helping me feel prepared to go to college next year. I will be going to Tennessee State University this fall. Being with Beacon staff and my peers have provided something to look forward to and has given me a positive perspective in life, even during really hard times. Every young person deserves to have an out-of-school program like Beacons. Thank you. Ms. Sims, thank you for sharing your experience. So glad that, that uh, you're caught up and, and have uh, your future plans locked in. That's wonderful. Uh, last uh, testifier that I have is Carrie dennison Kaneen, Executive Director of Ignite After School. Ms. dennison Kaneen, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Dabney. Hello, my name is Carrie dennison Kaneen. I'm the Executive Director of Ignite After School. And again, thank you, um, Chair and members of the committee uh, for taking some time today to hear more about House File 786. Um, I wanted to share a little bit more about what is in the bill, um, some of the content of the bill. Uh, and um, I wanted to start by sharing that uh, House File 786 does update the After School Community Learning Grant Program, which has not seen an appropriation since the 0708 um, biennium. And it is a competitive grant program to fund comprehensive, well-designed, and coordinated after school and summer learning opportunities for students in K-12, just like some of the opportunities that uh, other testifiers have shared. The goals of the after school community learning program are there are four of them. The first is to strengthen positive youth adult relationships and to promote healthy behavior, attitudes, um, and relationships. And this is a really um, important goal to support social emotional learning as well as the mental health needs of young people. The second goal is to develop skills that will really support young people as they transition to higher education and career opportunities, which um, both Michelle and Michaela spoke to. Also to encourage school attendance and improve academic performance, as well as to expand access to after school and summer learning programming for underserved uh, young people um, and communities. I also wanted to share a little bit about um, the research that shows that after school opportunities can achieve these four goals. And there is lots of research and I'm only going to focus on one piece and that is uh, a recent longitudinal study that was conducted that, that followed about 1300 young people from birth to age 26. It's called the study of early care needs development. And it found that regular participation in organized after school activities during elementary school led to higher math and reading test scores at age 15, which is that really critical ninth grade transition year. It also showed that students reported greater levels of confidence and other social emotional um, factors. And uh, lastly, regular participation at the middle and the high school level uh, acted as a protective factor against substance abuse up to age 26. The After School Community Learning Grant Program is designed to support after school programs that can have similar outcomes. 
This competitive grant program, if you and this is in subdivision three, um, is open to all types of after school program providers. And we think it's really critically important to make sure that community based organizations, park systems, libraries, and schools all have access and are encouraged to partner with one another. <laughs> it also ensures equitable distribution of funds across the state and works both rural, suburban, large, and smaller cities. It focuses on low income and other underserved students and allows communities to provide multi-age programming to students so that whole families can be served. This is really important because we often see that older youth don't participate in opportunities because they're providing um, care for their younger siblings. And this, uh, the way we've designed this would allow communities to provide holistic programming across ages. This in subdivision four, you will see that this also invests in professional development and continuous improvement for after school programs. In order for after school programs to hit on the outcomes that I've outlined, they really do need to be engaged in professional development, evaluation, and continuous improvement. And this bill ensures that happens. Um, this, it, the time right now is critically important for this investment because even prior to the pandemic, we started to see a decline in participation in after school. Not because young people aren't interested, but because they lack access. The America After Three is a parent survey that's been conducted since 2004. And for the the first time since the start of the survey in 2020, we saw a decline in regular participation by young people in Minnesota. But we also found that for every one young person in an after school program, three more wanted to participate but said they didn't have access. We also um, see this in sort of the gaps in funding. So in 21st Century Community Learning Center grant program, a federal program administered by MDE, um, they're only able to fund about one third of the applications they received. And in order to fund all of the eligible um, or the qualified applicants, they would need an additional 51 million over three years. Ignite After School was also recently tapped by MDE to administer the 1% after school set aside that was part of the American Rescue Plan Acts SR3 funds. And we are very proud to share that we just announced the 21 grantees, um, but we were still $22 million short of funding all of our qualified applications. So young people and families have experienced a great number of stressors during the pandemic, and we know now um, more than ever that this type of investment is really critical to bring together community sites, schools, and others to ensure young people's success moving forward. Thank you, and I thank you for your support of House File 786. Ms. Dennison Kaneen, thank you for uh, that detailed testimony. When the hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of the bill hearing. We received two requests for public information. Mr. Uni, if you would please introduce yourself for the record again and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you again. My name is Adosh Uni. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. And thanks for the opportunity to testify on Representative Lee's uh, HF 786. As you've heard today, much of what I'll, uh, what, much of what I'll cover is has been spoken about, but I think it bears repeating. So after school opportunities to offer high quality programming that meet the needs of students and their families. And these enrichment activities complement and reinforce the school day program and engage families of students who are served in the programs. Until this year, the 21st Century Community Learning Center's grant program was only dedicated federal source of funding for after school and the largest source of funding for after school programming in Minnesota. And Minnesota, as you've also heard, has a history of funding after school programs. In the 90s, the state operated the after school enrichment program, but the funding for this program ended in 2002. The After School Community Learning Center's grant program was originally established in 2007 and provided funding to community or nonprofit organizations, political subdivisions, child care centers, and school based programs that served youth after school or during non school hours. And again, as you heard, the funding provided grants to 21 after school program providers for two years. But again, the program ended in 2009. Now, just in uh, last year, the 
the ESSER funds or the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds included in the American Rescue Plan or AFP, ARP included 1% set asides for summer and after school program. The governor uh, designated $13.2 million for each. That would equal the 1% set aside um, out of this third round for the for the summer and after school programming. And as you heard, uh, the after school programming was done in partnership with Ignite After School. And uh, the 13 point, the other $13.2 million for summer enrichment will be administered by the Department of Education. Both of these buckets require half of their funding to go to culturally specific community organizations to ensure their expertise is recognized and supported. Fortunately, those funds will expire in 2024 but the need for access to high quality after school programs will continue. Additional state funding would ensure that high quality after school program is accessible to all students. So the governor has also proposed funding for after school programs in his 2022 budget at $5 million per year. And as you've heard today, and we've learned through the pandemic now more than ever, these opportunities are crucial for our students' success. So thank you again for the opportunity to provide support for this effort and the governor's $5 million per year uh, proposal for after school programming and uh, to provide ongoing support for our schools, students, and families into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. Uh, next and last on the agenda, um, Rick Heller. Mr. Heller, welcome to the committee for the 2022 session. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony, sir. Uh, you can hear me? We can. Thank you. Um, my name is Rick Heller, unofficial representative, twice eligible. I did post in the chat uh, the correspondence that wasn't didn't get to you in time. That was it's my understanding that uh, it will be posted later. Anyhow, uh, since I'm testifying today on two of similar bills, I look, look like it's going to pass in the, uh, the Senate because of the identical bill. This file today is 786. Uh, specifically, I like to talk about, if I may, about third party vendors uh, that are going to be part of this. What I've provided is uh, some some documents from the State Department about Ignite After School. There's nothing really in this in the summary that gets into that. And what I posted there was uh, was the special education uh, director form there. That what they said it was they using 50% of funding. And then also in the American uh, Research Plan, also mentions on page 50 and 77 uh, on page 50 of page 77. Specifically, cultural Pacific outcomes. Uh, again, the, the summary doesn't get into that. And the, and the reason I highlighted social emotional, you'll see that when you get the document and, and mental health needs. Since I unofficially apparently represent the twice exceptional, I believe uh, that uh, emotional behavior disturbance is important. Peaceful. However, since Mr. Uni there and, and at the chair, would, he would yield to the question is that school districts are not required to have a strategy plan for uh, social emotional uh, when it comes to, there was an alignment study I sent out earlier to the group that was done uh, that's tied to the achievement standards. And school districts again are not required to utilize that. It's something you might consider to do that if uh, school districts start aligning social emotional aspects, one of the pillars of isn't just about achievement, it's about how they function in a classroom. I think it's pretty relevant uh, to, to everybody here on this. Uh, I, would, I would ask you to look uh, that the, the change happened. They, used, they also merged blind and print disabled in 2018. Now it's eligible. So we're, we're frankly, uh, we're all in this together now and it has to do with digital accessibility. So anyways, uh, last thing, well, most important thing, if, again, through the chair, Mr. Uni has expressed before that third parties don't have to apply Section uh, 508 or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Would Mr. Uni be willing to answer that question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Heller. Mr. Uni, uh, any response at this time? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Heller, I, I don't have the information for you right now for the specific question, but I'd be happy to take it offline and, and address it there. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you Chair, to allow that to happen. And also, uh, not to be isolated, but I would ask you that you would forward that response to the chair since he was interested. And I think some of the committee members are too uh, regarding this. Thank you again uh, for not isolating in the situation. Thank you, Mr. Heller. Uh, members, any questions on the bill?
Seeing none. Representative Lee, do you have any closing comments for us? I just want to say thank you again, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members for the consideration and especially uh, thank you to our testifiers for coming by to talk about their experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lee. Thank you, testifiers. With that, Representative Feist renews her motion to lay over House File 786 as amended for possible inclusion or further consideration at a later date. Members, our final bill pre presentation will be hearing from Representative Mahler about a bill to create two mental health leads at MDE, the department. Members, it's our intention to lay this bill over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill by 1155. Chair Richardson, would you like to make a motion to move House File 1083 before the committee and to lay it over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? Representative Sandsteed, would you be able to make that motion for us? So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Representative Sandsteed. Welcome to the committee, Representative Mahler. Before you introduce your bill, I understand you have a, an author's amendment you'd like to offer uh, to get the bill in the shape you'd prefer. I'll move uh, the A1 amendment to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape you'd, you'd desire. Uh, Representative Mahler, can you please uh, speak to the A1 amendment briefly? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So the A1 amendment is based on some stakeholder um, feedback, just to make it very clear that the bill is, the intent of the bill is to create positions at MDE and not to put any burden on school districts. That's what the amendment does. Thank you very much. With that, um, members, uh, this is a voice vote. If you would please unmute. All those in favor of the A1 amendment, the author's amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Representative Mahler, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So House File 1083 is a bill that you have heard before. It creates a lead position at MDE to assist school districts in developing an evidence-based response to student mental health. This year, we're also creating a lead position to address teacher and staff mental health. When I started working on this bill in 2018, student mental health was in a state of crisis. Even before the pandemic, every educator I talked to said students were experiencing growing mental health needs and that those needs were not being met. Students have also been telling us that this is a problem. In 2019, suicide was the second leading cause of death for young people. The 2019 student survey indicated a growing number of students who felt depressed and anxious. And this was before the pandemic. You'll hear testimony today about how the pandemic and other factors have exacerbated the mental health needs of students. In addition, you will also hear about the growing and urgent need to assist our teachers and staff with their mental health needs. When they are working with students who have experienced trauma, it impacts them. Essentially, these two positions at MDE will create a clearinghouse for districts, teachers, staff, students, and their families on mental health. It doesn't require the districts to do anything, but rather these leads will gather and share evidence-based strategies with districts to address the mental health needs of students, teachers, and staff. I wanna thank MDE for their support and assistance, and you'll also see letters of support in your packet from NAMI, at Allies, Minnesota School Social Workers Association, Mental Health Minnesota, Suburban Ramsey Family Collaborative, and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Education Minnesota also supports this bill. And with that, Mr. Chair, I believe Amy Jones will be my first testifier. Thank you, Representative. Ms. Jones, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Amy Jones. I'm a self-employed educational consultant working to improve mental health for students and school staff in Minnesota. I'm a 30-year licensed classroom teacher. I've worked in education at all levels, including as an elected school board member in the Mountie District an administrator in Minneapolis and Stillwater, an instructional coach, classroom teacher, and adjunct professor at the university level. I'm a governor appointed member of the Minnesota State Advisory Council on Mental Health and the Mental Health and Schools Work Group. I'm also a certified mental health first aid facilitator for youth and adults. I've been working with Representative Muller for the last four years to add a position for a comprehensive mental health lead at MDE. We are one of the very few states that doesn't have such a position. We need it now more than ever. 
During our recent discussions with stakeholders, state agencies, and education organizations, everyone agreed with the need to add a lead position to support and coordinate improved mental health for staff and teachers as well. Minnesota is behind most states in having state level leads for mental health in schools. We acknowledge and appreciate all the work that is already happening at MDE. Our stakeholders need a point person, someone to contact, someone who can coordinate and pull all of the good work together for the benefit of every student, teacher, and school staff member. We need someone who can communicate with stakeholders and seek out promising practices that can be shared across the state. Representative Muller and I have been working to provide more mental health support in Minnesota schools after seeing a growing and timely need. House File 1083 would put Minnesota in line with other states that have a mental health in schools lead in the Department of Ed. This position would not be tied to overseeing a grant, rather it would provide a much needed contact person to address the many challenges and opportunities currently facing our students' mental health. We updated the bill to add a position for mental health lead for staff and teachers. This would be a non-grant funded position at the Department of Ed to support staff and teacher mental health. More than ever before, we see our school staff and teachers struggling with their own mental health and in the challenge to support the mental health of their students. In the midst of the third school year of the pandemic, we have many qualified, passionate, exceptional staff and teachers leaving the profession. Not only is this a workforce crisis, but the stability of our educational system will be greatly impacted if we continue to hemorrhage these talented and dedicated staff and teachers. Our state deserves positions to oversee and coordinate this work so that both our students and our staff and teachers have the support they need to stay in our schools and be effective and successful. These crucial positions are long overdue, and if the pandemic has shown us anything, it has illuminated this glaring and growing need to improve mental health in our schools. Our students, school staff, and teachers deserve this support. I thank you for your time and hope for your support of House File 1083. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Next on the list, Al Levine, Assistant Principal with the St. Paul Public Schools and a member of the Minnesota Advisory Committee for Mental Health and Suicide Task Force. Principal Levine, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for letting me testify today. My name is Al Levin and I am an Assistant Principal in St. Paul Public Schools. I've been in the district since February of 1999 and have been in an administrative role for approximately 15 years. I'm a governor appointed member of the Minnesota State Advisory Council on Mental Health. I serve on the state suicide prevention task force and I'm a mental health advocate. I've been advocating for better systems of supports for our educators since well before the current pandemic. Many of our students are going in and out of complex trauma on a daily basis. These traumas often manifest through our students' behaviors throughout the school day, and they have implications and consequences on the mental health of our staff. These challenges have only been exacerbated by the current pandemic. Dealing with the behaviors and supporting our students through their challenging situations oftentimes creates trauma, known as vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, or compassion trauma for our educators. While tending to the mental health needs and challenges of the classrooms, many of our educators now have more and more trauma of their own due to the pandemic. We have educators who are dealing with their own health issues or those of a loved one due to the pandemic. We have a teacher shortage, a substitute shortage, and a paraprofessional shortage. Our teachers are pulled to substitute in other classrooms during their prep times, leaving no time throughout the day to prepare for their lessons or to grade work let alone time to process some of the traumatic situations that occur in their classrooms. It is not unusual to have an educator in my office in tears, wondering if they'll be able to finish the week or even the day without more support for their students or for their own mental health. I know of educators who have walked out during the school day due to stress. I know of educators who have had to deal with a suicidal student and after calling for support are asked to continue with their lesson. No processing, no additional support. The situation is dire. Many seasoned educators are stating that these past couple of years have been the most challenging of their career. Educators are leaving the profession at an alarming rate. Last November, Education Minnesota stated, the teachers union can't remember a time when so many teachers left their jobs during the year and were not even into December yet. A non-grant funded position at MDE that would focus on the mental health of our educators is imperative to public education. While there is a great deal of talk and work towards supporting our students, it is time that we focus on the mental health of our educators as well. I urge you to support this bill. Public education is relying on it. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Next, Sarah Washington, a parent advocate, and member of the Minneapolis Public Schools mental health team as a community member. Ms. Washington, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Washington. I am a mother of four and a grandmother of five. Now is the time to step up and ensure that our students and teachers' mental health is supported. Just as we have policies and programs designed to nurture children's physical health, we must also support children's social emotional development. Research supports the importance of mental health services in schools. Schools help shape children's and adolescents' development. Children spend more than half of their waking hours in school. Data indicates that students are substantially more likely to seek mental health support when school-based services are available. School-based services may help reduce the stigma in seeking help for mental health concerns. One of the primary reasons that individuals and families do not seek support, early screening, identification, and interventions to address mental health issues prevents long-term negative impact on a child's learning and relationships and health. Now let's talk about our teachers. You all have heard the phrase, when you are flying on a plane, to put your oxygen mask on first. If teachers and staff are not healthy, they cannot help the kids. We are at an all-time high of losing staff because they are burnt out and not being able to get support for mental wellness. The struggle bus of this pandemic has increased this need even more. Beyond the pandemic, there are many stressors that are happening in the world today. Racism, gun violence, trauma on trauma. With the huge surplus, it is time to put that money in districts, children's, families, and communities. We have a chance to amend the bill, update it, and try again. I am, in, I am endorsing and in full support for adding a permanent non-grant position at MDE to support students and teachers, staff, mental health at the state level. We need someone in this position to coordinate, collaborate with other agencies and help schools so they can better help students. Minnesota can lead the way in creating two lead positions, one to coordinate mental health for students and one to coordinate and lead mental health work for staff and teachers. Please help me and support this bill as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Next on the agenda, Matt McCoy, Wyatt's dad. Mr. McCoy, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, please excuse the lack of video feed as I uh, road conditions do not make it possible for me to get back to the office in time for this hearing, so I'm on a mobile device. Uh, my name is Matthew Coy. I am a lifelong resident of Southeast Minnesota, a business owner, a volunteer firefighter, EMT, engaged parent, mental health advocate, and most importantly, a dad to Wyatt and Morgan. My son Wyatt lost his battle with mental health in January of 2017 at the young age of 18. It is my view that managing the current mental health crisis, especially in our children, teens, and young adults requires a multifaceted approach. One of those facets is to address the gap between the supply of qualified providers and the demand for services and resources. Another facet of that is prevention and management to recognize at-risk individuals and intervene prior to becoming a crisis for that individual. This is where House File 1083 can be of great importance and make profound impact. Establishing lead roles at the state level will not only give us much needed attention and support to our young people by bringing in tool by bringing tools and resources to our students early on, but will also serve to coordinate the various grassroots efforts currently being undertaken by individual educators and districts. A second lead role operating primarily in the teacher and staff space is no less important. Since my son's death, I've had the, I've had the opportunity to lead and, and participate in many workshops uh, with educators, paraprofessionals, administrators, and staffers. And a very common theme is the threat to their mental health, that is our teachers and our staffers. These individuals are operating in an environment where the goal is so very important, yet the resources to reach that goal are riddled with challenges such as access to tools and providers. <clears throat> One of the common phrases I hear from these folks are things like, I have no idea what I'm, what I'm doing when trying to support these kids. And when it goes bad, I feel responsible. I also hear things like, I want so badly to help our kids, but how can I when I have no idea how to help myself? The express concern in these interviews reminds me of a phrase that's frequently used in the EMT and firefighter space. And that is, a dead EMT can't help anyone. 
So make sure we're taking care of ourselves. So true it is, so it is also true in the space of mental health. We need to make sure that our frontline responders, which are so very often educators, are able to effectively care for themselves so they can be effective in caring for others. To that end, I'm asking for your support of House File 1083. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I appreciate your attention. Mr. McCoy, thank you for, for sharing your family's uh, experience. Our condolences on the loss of, of Wyatt, and we appreciate your advocacy. Uh, last on the agenda, uh, Katie Pickell, Principal in Residence, University of Minnesota. Ms. Pickell, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, Katie Pickell, uh, Principal in Residence, University of Minnesota. I've had the um, honor to lead four statewide surveys during the pandemic of educators, families, and students. Um, Across those four surveys, nearly 54,000 individuals have continually told us that mental health is their number one concern. The thing that I wanna point out today is that they not only consistently tell us it is their number one concern, they have been growing more concerned over time. So one of the surveys that we did um, on behalf of the Minnesota Department of Education through the Wisconsin and Minnesota Comprehensive Center called the Safe Learning Survey, which I know you've gotten copies of and are available online. Um, indicate that while mental health was a number one concern, I'm gonna use the example of teachers in the first iteration of that survey in the winter of 2021 at 50% of teachers saying it was their number one concern, that grew to 71% by the fall. So teachers are growing more concerned about mental health over time. I often get the question, well, what do they think needs to happen? Um, and this, these are the supports that families um, students and educators tell us they need. Families tell us they want prevention and intervention around bullying and harassment. Students tell us that they want intervention for self-harm and suicide. They also would like to see more positive student to teacher relationships. And educators want more support for students and staff mental health, as well as opportunities for students to build relationships with peers, which ties to the testimony that you heard before ours around out of school time programming. We did a recent survey of um, just school principals and uh, assistant principals and um, charter school leaders. And we asked them about um, specifically COVID-19 and the most significant ongoing challenge for them, of course, 68% said it was student mental health and staff mental health. When asked what supports they need, one in 10 principals told us that they need support for themselves and their own mental health. And over 70% said they need resources for students and staff mental health. Um, unfortunately, my testimony is the numbers to the personal stories that you've already heard today. Ms. Pacal, thank you very much for, for those numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate it. Uh, members, we only have a few minutes left, but I see two members have raised their hands. Representative Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Representative uh, Moeller for bringing this bill uh, forward. It is so needed. What we continue to hear from uh, our school personnel is that they're not okay. We're hearing from our students that they are not okay. And we have found ourselves in a um, position where we have traumatized people trying to help traumatized people. And that's not a sustainable situation. Uh, to be in. And so really just wanted to take an opportunity to thank you for your advocacy, for your uh, leadership on this, and also to thank all the testifiers for continuing to bring up um, the concerns um, and, and, and the issues and just want you to know that um, uh, we hear you, we, we support you, and I am um, looking forward to voting in support of the bill today. Thank you, Representative Richardson. Representative Thompson. I too wanted to also echo uh, some of the things that Representative Richardson just said so we could save time, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, but what I always talk about uh, mental health and behavioral health, not only for the, the uh, staff, but for the students and also the first responders also. Just imagine walking into a house and having to see dead bodies and then going to the next call or witnessing that and having to go to school and not have anything to eat. I always talk about mental health because I'm also someone who benefits from speaking to a behavioral health specialist uh, chair, just on a personal note, but it has to have some, we can't create these positions without culturally competent 
people or what we'll do is create pathways to prison again or di misdiagnose people who look just like me. And I wanna make sure that we get it right and not just say, this is what we're gonna do. I wanna make sure that we get it right because you hear from the majority of our students saying they need help. And so I just wanted to make sure that I, 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 I put that in the atmosphere and have people to just think about that when we're talking about like helping people, you know, hurt people do hurt people. And I honestly know that for a fact, I think uh, sister, uh, uh, um, our, our colleague said it just perfectly just a second ago, uh, hurt people do hurt people. And so some people just need someone to talk to, to actually like balance life. And so I'm gonna thank you and I will be looking forward to supporting this. So thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Last up, Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna make sure my volume is up so I can hear. Um, members, there's, uh, and to the testifier who lost your son, very sorry to hear that. We hear stories like that all the time and they're, they're tragic and, and, and difficult. Uh, but members, we don't need this bill. Uh, MDE has the money, they have the ability, uh, the governor could do executive orders as he's done in other areas. This is a bipartisan agreement. And while I appreciate Representative Mueller bringing the bill up and bringing light to this, MDE could be doing this right now. In fact, they could have done it already. And so rather than waiting for them to ask our permission, why don't we just demand that they make this happen? Uh, they have the ability, they've done it with other areas in the past. So why would we have to debate this here uh, when it could already be done. So I, I don't understand the, the deference to the legislation on this when they could just have done it and, and moved on. Thank you, Representative Krisha. And members, when I, I indicated that Representative Krisha was last, I had not seen uh, Representative Draskowski's hand up. Representative Draskowski, I, I can give you two minutes. Okay, shorter than that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just a question maybe for you. I wanna know if uh, the current biennium's budget has been set. Well, thank you for the question, Representative Draskowski. I, I know that uh, some folks on your side of the aisle have been proposing tax cuts for corporations, even though uh, we did pass a bill after a, a long special session last year. So uh, bipartisanly, there seems to be agreement that uh, Minnesota has the resources to review its current spending against the needs of its citizens and uh, respond. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know what, exactly what that meant, but uh, I do know for sure that uh, last year during our budget setting session, uh, we set the budget for the state of Minnesota for every area within the budget, including this area. And so that budget is set um, and it's full, government is fully funded between now and June 30th of 2023. We made that decision. Um, and it's unfortunate that Democrats keep coming forward and asking for more, 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 more of the people's money simply because it's being over collected here. The government's fully funded, Mr. Chair, because of that, I'm voting no. Um, we should uh, entertain bills like this. It might be good ideas next year during our budget setting session. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Drezkowski. Um, to those on the committee who want to are eager to vote yes on the bill and those who are eager to vote no on the bill, you're going to have to wait. Uh, because I'll remind you the motion before us uh, is to lay over the bill for today. But with that, Representative Moeller, do you have any closing comments? I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. And thanks to the testifiers. And just to briefly address Representative Precia's point, um, we do need to fund this position at MDE. Much of the great work that MDE is, being do is doing in the mental health space is grant funded. Um, and we need to permanently create this position just like most states have this position in their Department of Education. Um, I do want to just mention to Mr. Chair, when we talk about this topic, for anybody watching that there is help available to folks. The National Su Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255, or people can also text MN to 741-741. And with that, Mr. Chair, I want to thank you for hearing this bill, and I look forward to members being able to eventually vote yes in support of it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Mueller. And with that, Representative Sandsteed renews her motion to lay over House File 1083 as amended for possible inclusion or further consideration at a later date. Uh, thank you to all the bill authors uh, today. Thank you to all the bill 
testifiers for their time sharing their perspectives with us. Uh, members with that, uh, tomorrow we will focus on the academic achievement needs of students in Minnesota. And for now, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.